Okay, great. Thank you, friends, uh, for letting us into your home or wherever you are. I'd like to start right away, as we usually do. Uh, this time I'd like to start and simply say a few words about why I really like the, the format of why we're doing these presentations in this way with speakers, presenters, if you will. So let me just share a few comments on that before I introduce our presenter today, Gardner Sensei. You know, we're all connected. <laughs> you know, we're already one with the universe. There's no separation unless we create it. We are one with the universe and you can experience that connection every day. It's not special. It's not a mystery. It's right in front of you right now. If you just get out of your own way. So we train to experience universal principles, but we in our bodies are particulars and we view the world through the lens of our experience, which is necessarily different for each of us. So I like it that we're celebrating our differences on these calls, focused upon how each of us in our own lives differently applies key in daily life. This is the reason why I enjoy hearing from and learning from our members in these sessions. It's really wonderful to get to know people much more deeply and understand their personal interests off the mat, because in this way we become familiar with the many perspectives that instructors have based upon their own life experience. I mean, just think of it. Last week, uh, we heard from Atwater Sensei, who's the youngest head instructor in our Eastern Key Federation, and what a treat that was. And then here it is this week, and I'll say our most mature head instructor, Gardner Sensei, who will turn 92 September 1st. We're going to have the benefit of his perspective and many more years of experience and many different teachers that he has had over the years. So all of us necessarily see the world through a limited lens of our own life experience. That's the reason why when I did the four part Saikon Tong series, I was very careful to say, I'm simply sharing a story of a personal journey of connection with Tohei Sensei based upon our shared interests, as I explained during those four sessions. Uh, just today, in fact, uh, in fact, about an hour and a half ago, I received a call from Chin Sensei. And we were discussing this and that. And you know, his life experience is different from mine, which is different from Kashiwai Sensei, which is different from Curtis Sensei, which is different from Pierce Sensei. You know, we all have our life experience and our relationships and our training with our, our teachers. So as long as we're following the principles correctly, there's not one best way to learn, not one best way to teach, and not one best way to apply key principles in daily life. As instructors, our challenge is to be flexible and to really read our students well, to understand where are they coming from, so we can develop trust and develop a, a kind of connection to support each different person in their own way. Um, you know, Toy Sensei would say, some people follow a rule of the mind and you go up the mountain this way. Some people learn better by training the body and you go up this way. But at the end, it, it, it ends in the same place. 
So that's our challenge. And not only that, but we all come to this art for different reasons. Um, to be a better musician or a better athlete explains Ileana's uh, journey and my journey, uh, respectively. Some people come to train because they learned about something to do with key development and they, they learned, you know what, I want to learn how to focus. Or some people say, I want to learn how to relax. Um, some people, in fact, many people say, I want to learn a martial art. I think that's the case with our speaker today, who, by the way, has trained for over 70 years, 70 years in the martial arts. Amazing. Some people start their journey because they're seeking some kind of spiritual awakening. Other people might want to, you know, they, they learn the four basic principles and they go, whoa, I want to, I want to live my whole life with my mind and body unified and use my whole iceberg. The good news is, is that as you learn over the years, guess what? Your interests change. Um, and they expand and they deepen. And eventually, if you've been training a long time, this is all going to come to an apex where you're interested in spirituality and how this connects to maybe deeper things other than self-improvement. So we could say that there are as many benefits in this training as there are particular interests that the students possess. Yet the genius of Toy Sensei's teachings, having captured these universal principles that he discovered and Kaicho Sensei is teaching us now and reinforcing, the genius is if we can learn the universal principles and understand them well, this enables you to apply them, key training, in every aspect of your life, mentally, physically, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. That's why I'm always saying over the years, this phrase, your life is your monastery. Of course, the spiritual aspect of our training is most important, but it's a mistake to think that you have to do things to achieve or arrive at a particular state of being in order to experience this deep connection with the universe itself. Training is like peeling a banana or an onion. You're removing layers of dust, Saikontong, or filters, or things that cover your consciousness. And when, when you let go of these filters, your blindness disappears. And you will awaken to the fact that you are already one with the universe. You are already unified. And, and you don't have to do anything at all. That's why when you relax completely, everything's already done. So <clears throat> that's why I like these calls because we're celebrating everyone's different take and their experience. And we're all pursuing this idea of understanding the principles correctly and then applying them to our life. So <clears throat> let me transition here to introduce our speaker, Gardner Sensei, someone for whom I have a lot, a ton of respect. When I was thinking about his characteristics that I'm gonna share with you, Believe it or not, they're the same characteristics of the triple sage <clears throat> in Sai Kong Tung. Most importantly, you're going to find with Gardner Sensei, a man of deep humility. And just like in Sai Kong Tung, the idea is, you, you know, walk humbly and don't show the fact that you have such inner strength. Gardner Sensei is just such a man. Um, he's wise. I, I have gone to him over the years countless times because I can see and feel his wisdom. He is amazing. 
he is positive. Now, all of you who know him, he's always positive. He's always grateful. He's always supportive of everyone around him. He's very sensitive. <clears throat> he has a keen eye. He's disciplined. He's patient. And he perseveres with the beginner's mind all these 91 years. Gardner Sensei sees, and whenever I'm teaching how to see, he sees very well, maybe more than most people realize, or I hope you realize it. Um, and, and I am really grateful that he moved from the West Coast here, and he's going to explain that journey, um, because he's been just an incredible uh, resource and sounding board for me personally. I'd like to publicly, it's in the acknowledgments of living with the wind at your back, but remember when Stone Sensei was uh, teaching his class and I said, whoa, you know, you may not have known this, but the very, very first draft of living with the wind at your back, Stone Sensei uh, saw and edited. Well, Gardner Sensei has probably read this book 10 times more than anyone else on the planet because Gardner Sensei was, uh, did the copy editing the very, very detailed, painstaking, you gotta know your grammar and punctuation copy editing of Living with the Wind at Your Back. And I just wanna publicly acknowledge um, his, his role uh, there. And uh, now, so I don't take up too much more time, let me just give some biographical background as I do each time. Uh, Gardner Sensei was born in the great state of Illinois, same as myself. <laughs> but he grew up in Southern California, and he spent 30 years in the United States military. He enlisted in the uh, United States Army straight out of high school, and he served in Japan uh, during the U.S. occupation uh, after World War II. In terms of his education, um, he started at John Muir College uh, studying engineering, and he received his Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Southern California, Civil Engineering. Then he went on to the Air Force Institute of Technology uh, with uh, degrees in aeronautical engineering and aircraft structural design. Uh, that led to the Institute of Analyses at the University of Maryland, where he has a Master of Arts in Defense Economics and Systems Analysis. And he attended numerous other military schools including Squadron Officer School, Command and Staff College, Air University, and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. He retired from the United States Air Force as a Colonel and Command Pilot with over 5,000 hours of flying time and over 320 combat missions. His experience um, as a fighter pilot and command and staff assignments included um, the fields of aircraft operations, engineering management, technical intelligence, and logistics management. His last assignment was as director of logistics for the Air Force Space Transformation, uh, Transportation System, AKA the Space Shuttle, uh, plus Vandenberg Air Force Base Space Shuttle Launch Complex. And it was a real treat this, this uh, January when we had our guest instructor, Nonaka Sensei. Uh, Gardner Sensei uh, kind of guided us on a tour of the Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. It was pretty amazing. You walk around and he goes, oh yeah, I flew that one and that one over there. And that's a piece of junk. This one over here, this is a great aircraft. You, you need to see this aircraft. So <laughs> we're like, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> but that's, that, that's a true story, just this January. So he, as I mentioned, he has trained and taught in various forms of martial arts for over 70 years. <laughs> and it's kind of odd to say, and most recently, he spent 40 years studying Aikido and 30 years in Tai Chi Chuan. Um, and currently he is the co-head instructor of Loudoun Valley Ki Aikido. He's a Rokudan, Sixth Dan, Joden, and an associate examiner. And with all of that, uh, Sensei, I'm sorry that I took a bit of your time, but I will mute myself and turn it over to Gardner Sensei 
and thank you for your preparation and the opportunity to hear from you today. Well, thank you, Sensei. Can, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, uh, thank you for those glowing words. I'm not sure that I can live up to all that stuff that you're uh, telling these people, but um, I'll give it my best to, to keep trying. Uh, you've actually uh, covered parts of my, uh, my presentation here already, which I appreciate. Uh, so anyway, thank you for your introduction. And uh, Matthew, thank you for, to you also for uh, taking my scribbled notes and uh, putting them into a, a professional uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation here. So I appreciate that very much. Um, let's see. So uh, I guess uh, Harold Sensei is, is flipping the slides. Uh, where is he? Okay, so uh, uh, call this uh, universality, it's everywhere. So um, uh, you uh, to start out with, let me, let me just cover a couple other points on personal background there. Uh, if you want to flip to the next slide, uh, Harold Sensei. So uh, as uh, Shader Sensei mentioned, I was uh, born at a very early age in Illinois and um, we moved back and forth several times between Illinois and California until we finally settled in California. And uh, so I went through school and then graduated at 17 and went immediately into the Army. And uh, with World War II being in its wrap up phase, why so I, uh, I was uh, put aboard a, a luxury troop ship up in uh, Seattle and uh, started out on a, a cruise across the Pacific, and, uh, which took 14 days. And I uh, ended up in, in uh, Yokohama. So I spent uh, a little bit of time in Yokohama, uh, in the Tokyo area, and then uh, we were moved down to uh, Kyushu, uh, just south of uh, uh, Fukuoka. And uh, I'm sure that Matthew is aware of this, having spent some time in Fukuoka. At any rate, um, uh, <clears throat> when I got out of the army, then I came back, went to college, and while uh, while in college, I started flying. So I was as much much as I had to get afford. Uh, I took maybe a half an hour of instruction every two weeks, which didn't build up a lot of time very quickly. But at any rate, uh, got me started. And then, as uh, Shana Sensei mentioned, uh, I spent 30 years in the Air Force. Uh, having uh, graduated from USC at the same time, uh, having been involved in ROTC uh, with a uh, second lieutenant's commission. So anyway, uh, uh, and they, they jumped me around so many, in many different fields that I wasn't really quite sure what I was specialized in. So it uh, proved to be very good in adapting, uh, in being a, building up my adaptability. So, okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, so Aikido history, well, backing up just a little bit, um, in the Army, I started uh, with just doing hand-to-hand -hand combat. We didn't know much about uh, Asian martial arts at that time. And uh, so anyway, we, we did what was returned to as hand-to-hand combat. And then, uh, Later on in the Air Force, uh, when we started getting into uh, uh, knowing a little bit about Japanese martial arts, uh, I did a little bit of uh, judo and a little bit of Aikido, or a little bit of uh, karate. And then uh, toward the end of my Air Force career, um, I had been uh, flying an LSD, that's uh, large steel desk for uh, uh, several years and uh, I needed exercise. I hadn't been getting much exercise. So I started looking around the station in, uh, in Los Angeles, living in Redondo Beach. And I looked around and uh, ran across this uh, group who was practicing Aikido in a park uh, facility near where I lived. So I thought, well, this sounds good, not knowing what it was, and I don't think I ever heard of it. Uh, I stopped in one night, and uh, who did I run into but 
uh, Chin Sensei. So um, he's the one that really got me started. He is, those of you who know him, a great instructor and, and a great overall person in general. And uh, so I was training with him uh, until uh, 1984 when I moved up to Northern California. And uh, lo and behold, there's another uh, Kiaikido dojo up there. So I was with him for um, oh, about six years, I guess, six or seven years, until we moved back to uh, Virginia. And uh, once again, I was fortunate in uh, ending up near another uh, Key Society dojo. And so I trained with Simcox Sensei for, uh, from 1990 on until, uh, until he passed away. Uh, when we moved out to Loudoun County out here, I asked him if it would be okay to start a dojo out here since we didn't have any Aikido out in this area. And so he said, great, go ahead. And so I founded, uh, founded uh, Loudoun Valley in 1997. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, Shainer Sensei came along with, and EKF uh, got founded. And uh, I've been uh, listening very carefully to his guidance and uh, outstanding instruction ever since then. So uh, that, that brings you up to uh, that, that phase of my life. So let's go ahead and switch to the next one. So I call this universality, uh, it's a long word, the definition of which is the quality of being true in or appropriate for all situations. So I'm sure there are some naysayers out there, but certainly not in this group. But uh, and, and as uh, Shader Sensei mentioned also in his uh, prologue here, uh, in previous sessions, we've covered all sorts of people in all sorts of fields, uh, uh, talking about the, how these, these principles fit with the daily life and, and uh, in uh, running business and, and just running. And uh, so I, let's just take a look at one, one other set of experiences here. So next one, next slide, there, okay. Okay, the four principles. Now, I, I started late in Aikido, as, as you can see, uh, in probably my late 40s. And um, so actually what I came to find out was that I had been using these principles for all this time without ever knowing what they were or ever having heard of them for that matter. So let's let's see how how that sort of fit in with with my experience. Relax completely, and these are out of the order the ordinary order uh, because I felt they they fit a little better this way for my purposes. Uh, relax completely. Okay, so in flying, particularly when you get into higher performance airplanes, it's extremely important that you can relax enough where you can feel the controls, feel what's going on in the uh, in the machine uh, depending on what you're doing you may get uh, vibrations in uh, in the rudder pedals uh, you may get vibrations in the control stick uh, you may get uh, particularly at higher altitudes this this airplane by the way the reason i picked this is an f94 two f94s actually uh, which i was flying uh, in this case over uh, Labrador, so I snapped this picture out of the cockpit. Um, this particular airplane was, was quite a good airplane until you got up to higher altitudes and when it became less stable, and particularly when it was heavy. These tip tanks out here that you notice on the end of the, the wing, often called drop tanks, uh, were 230 gallon tanks. You know, that's a lot of weight. I forget what the weight is, but uh, a couple thousand pounds probably. And so when you get up to higher altitude in thinner air, these things were like walking a tightrope with one of these wild, uh, heavy sticks in, in, the, uh, in your arms, in your hands. So uh, 
you, you could get very easily into what we referred to as a PIO, a pilot induced oscillation. Whereas if you drop, if one tip drops, not, not falls off, but if one wing tip drops, um, if you're not relaxed enough to immediately correct, it's going to go back the other way. So you, this builds on, on, on you. So this oscillation continues until you almost get out of an out of control situation. So you really need to be relaxed. Uh, okay, weight underside. Let's see how that fits. Well, when you get into these machines, naturally you're going to try to settle in as comfortably and as naturally as possible, letting the weight settle to all the, all the bottom of your bottom parts, and uh, letting the, the arms and legs just sort of rest on the controls, feeling very light with no tension in the, in the limbs at all, so that again, you can, you can feel uh, any shutters, rudder, rudder jumps, uh, aileron flutters, anything like that that's going on. So, okay, let's flip one more. And um, keeping one point. So this uh, related to, to G-forces, um, we, this was before we actually had any uh, uh, G-suits. So if you went into a, a high, high speed pullout or high speed turn, pulling a lot of G's, you hardly had to tighten your gut up as much as you could to keep the blood from flowing out of your, out of your head. And so I've discovered after I found out what, what these principles were, that when I would do that and tighten my gut up as much as possible, the one place that I couldn't feel was sure enough the one point. And uh, so that, that again fits into the, the four principles perfectly. And extending key, um, you need to be extended, but relaxed, but the extension has to be a powerful extension. Uh, and the reason why I picked this, this film, this was taken uh, by me in a flight of uh, Mustangs uh, flying over Java when I was stationed in Indonesia. I had the opportunity and good luck to be able to fly with the Indonesian Air Force. Uh, and um, the, the engine in this thing was so powerful that if you didn't have a strong right leg on takeoff, particularly in high power situations, it would run you right off the runway. So you had to really tromp down on, on that and keep extended into the, into the right rudder pedal. So that pretty much covers the four principles. So I think you can see that, that my experience is sort of uh, led me into these principles and it wasn't until later that I really discovered what they were. Okay, next one. Okay, so we talked about connection. <clears throat> what do you need to do in flying these things? You need to become one with the airplane. Uh, so it, this is sort of like when you get in, you almost put it on like a jacket, like a coat. Uh, you need to be really uh, sort of know you, you of course you, you've you've studied the handbook you sat in the cockpit you've gone through uh, uh, blindfold checks of where everything is so you can find everything without even looking and uh, it's you just have to become one with it uh, it's uh, Okay, so and capabilities and limitations. Um, every airplane has its, has its uh, envelope that you've got to stay into. You, you've got to get the most out of the airplane, but you want to be careful that you don't exceed the limits because you can get into serious trouble with, uh, when you do that. Um, <clears throat> don't try and force controls. Uh, this is just like, uh, on a mat situation, you know, don't try to force a technique. Just take it easy and let it happen. Uh, don't push your luck. And again, with the relaxation, you can be ready for immediate reaction whenever these situations come to pass. 
Um, okay, let's switch to the next one there. Okay, so um, at the beginning of these sessions, uh, Shainer Sensei talked uh, uh, about the three orders of mind body awareness. So after he, the first session where he discussed this, I got to thinking to myself, I know these, I know about these uh, conditions, these orders, uh, but I've really only experienced them, or I thought I'd only experienced them in a static, a static mode. Uh, I could understand them well when I'm sitting trying to breathe or meditate, the first, second, and third orders. But what do you do when you go into a dynamic situation? So thinking back at a work, where could I find a dynamic situation as an example? Uh, this airplane explains what this is all about. Uh, when Vietnam first started up, a call went out looking for pilots with fighter experience who knew fighter tactics and fire arm, fighter armament and also ones who have had light airplane experience, particularly tail draggers, three wheel, you know, the tail and back. Uh, so I fell into that category and off I went. <clears throat> so we flew what were called uh, forward air control missions. And actually this took in a whole gamut of different types of missions, but the one I'm speaking of here is uh, let's say you, you get scrambled off, uh, called in to help out uh, ground forces, friendly ground forces that uh, have been overrun or are being overrun by, by enemy forces. And uh, so what you got to do is you jump in your airplane. You got to navigate to find where, where they are to start with. And then... Uh, once in the area, you got to uh, survey what's going on. You, you're, you're talking to uh, tactical air control center on one radio. You're talking to uh, the ground troops if you can get to them on uh, VHF radios. And then uh, if you have fighters in the area or whatever, you're talking to them on UHF radios. So you got three radios going. You're trying to listen to and talk on. Um, once in the area, you're trying to determine where exactly the friendlies are and where the less than friendlies are. Uh, you need to uh, assess the terrain, the weather, and everything that goes into the, the situation there. Often you'll have uh, helicopters that have entered the area for rescue missions and stuff like that. So at any rate, um, there's a lot going on. So um, Let's switch to the next next uh, chart there. So looking at the, the first at the third order, <clears throat> what do you see? You, you see exactly this, this situation that I'm talking about. Your mind is extremely busy. You got a lot going on, uh, monkey mind for sure. And uh, uh, it's, it's hard to really keep up with everything. So all right, am I operating in third order? Yeah, probably, definitely. Okay, second order. On the other hand, I might be focused strictly on one thing, which in this case would be the mission or the target, getting these people out safely, uh, whatever it is, to, to do what I was sent to do, which gets down to thinking of one thing only, which is brings us to second order. And then, uh, Moving on up from that, uh, there were times that I could think, I remember that I would be sitting in the middle of all this going on, almost like I was sitting on the outside looking in and not really thinking about anything in particular, which sounds an awfully lot like first order. So the question then is, what order was I operating in? And I wasn't really sure. So anyway, uh, I discussed this with Shainer Sensei a little bit, and uh, I, I gather that really what, uh, what's operating here is, is that 
you, you, you're changing orders as, as situations dictate. Uh, it's sort of a rolling situation going from one to another, perhaps, and on to the third and on back to the first or whatever. So um, you might uh, think about this next time you're in a dynamic situation. Try to determine what's going on in your mind. Where are you in orders of mind body awareness? Uh, even just driving down the street in, in a car, uh, on the mat for that matter. Uh, how about Rondori? You, you may have a lot of, lot of third order going on there. But uh, anyway, it's, it's interesting to, to try to determine where exactly you are in this situation or any situation that's of dynamic nature. Okay, let's flip the next one there. Okay, so uh, we have rather hurriedly gone over these four things that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, and uh, so having done that, uh, there's always a question that comes up, well, what, what have I learned in this past number of years that, uh, that I've been doing this Aikido stuff. So let's, let's flip to the next one there. Okay, well, these are things that I think I've learned or I, I'm still trying to learn. But the first one I would say is keep training. But when you're training, make sure that you're training correctly. Uh, you've heard the, uh, the frequently uh, quoted saying of, uh, uh, how does that go? Uh, training or practice makes perfect, but practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So you need to train correctly. Um, second point is if you first you don't succeed, just keep trying. Uh, nobody succeeds at first. So don't feel bad about it. Uh, you're going to learn from whether you succeed or you don't succeed. Uh, and then remember what you don't succeed at and improve on it. Uh, thirdly, uh, competition. You want to try to stay away from any comparisons or competition uh, with your students, with your instructor, with everybody in your daily life. Um, it's, it's, it just does do you absolutely no good. So the only thing you want to measure yourself is your past performance. And each time you get on the mat, you should be doing better than the last time. Okay, connection, develop, you got to develop connection with, with everybody and everything and be soft in that connection. It takes into account awareness. Be aware of everything that's going on so that you can connect with them. And then uh, back to the old goal and rule, treat everybody as you would like to be treated yourself. Uh, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, uh, take all that into account and treat everybody well. And then for instructors particularly, uh, I would say one thing, that's good to keep in mind is to try to teach others according to their needs and their capabilities. Don't try to push them too hard. Uh, be aware of any physical uh, limitations, uh, any mental limitations, any kind of limitations. Uh, limitations in how they're getting along with other people. So uh, try to, to adapt to each of their needs as much as possible. I know this is difficult to do in, in group classes and stuff like this, but uh, still it can be done. And so uh, that, that pretty well covers it, I think. Uh, let's see, did, is that the last slide, I think? I believe it was. So anyway, um, like I say, these, these were just a few things that, that I've picked up on over the years and uh, I'm still a work in progress myself. So 
Uh, that's about all I can contribute, I guess. So, Saner, Saner Sensei, back to you. Um, I'm going to turn it over. First of all, thank you very much, Gardner Sensei. I'm going to turn it over to Harold Sensei, who might be reviewing uh, questions that may have come in. Um, I, I have not looked at that, so I'm going to ask Carol Sensei to assist here. Well, I've re well, I've received no questions, but if anyone would like to raise a hand, or um, if you know how to do that, um, uh, and open your mic and ask a question, that would be great. I only know how to raise my physical hand. Can that work? <laughs> that works. <laughs> I'm interested in further discussing. Clearly, you're, you have a unified focus when you're in a high pressure situation flying an airplane with a mission. And clearly, you have many things that you're doing that have become um, part of just your organism that you don't have to think too much about. And you can still do them. Meanwhile, always changing to external environments, which you can't predict, and you have to be very in the moment. So I'm interested in um, your ideas of how you would describe that in terms of the three orders, which I think you were beginning to do, but I'm not sure. I don't even know how I would, but how would you describe it? Oh, uh, well, that's, that's, the, that's a, the problem a little bit. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you separate these things, because as you say, there's a lot going on and a lot of this be, comes from practice, 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 uh, and just being aware of doing things naturally as they're needed to be, as you need to do them, uh, without really thinking about them. And that's that sort of really falls into, in some ways, into first order. Because you're, that's why I say sometimes I would almost feel like I, I was just sort of observing the whole thing and it was happening around me because uh, you know you had to be very careful we had to be in close so we could see what was a monitor the situation on the ground uh, you had fighters coming in dropping armament and shooting at low altitudes one right after the other so you had to watch out for air-to-air uh, -air collisions uh, plus helicopters on the ground who often would be in your way when you didn't want them to. So you, you just had to uh, had to go with the flow. Uh, I'm not really sure how else to, to explain it. That's why I suggested that anybody in their daily life as they find themselves in a dynamic situation, and I'm hoping that they don't find themselves in a dynamic, as dynamic a situation as this, but um, try to feel where, where they're at. I don't know whether that helps or not, but. Uh, Gardner Sensei, that helps a lot because if I could interject, your answer um, is, a, I believe, my personal experience, is exactly how Toy Sensei would, would explain what was going on there. The fact that you were so highly trained and experienced, say one with the aircraft, the, the base, that he is basically a first order mode like that's if you, if you in your daily life could think gee is it possible for me just to be like a giant listener a giant eyeball without projecting judgment analysis praise blame likes dislikes you're, you're just being present but because you're you're what state of mind is, is more mirror like that's how you know when the appropriate thing to do is because the environment informs you now you need to be in second order now you need to be in third order um 
So when and how you go into different modes is actually dictated best when your mind is mirror like. Yeah. And and I'm, you know, I'm going out on a limb here, but uh, it may think, oh, no, that's, that's, that's too, I don't know, pedestrian or something. It's much more esoteric. I don't think so. It's, it's the same thing when an athlete, a peak performing athlete, might talk about a certain almost otherworldly experience during some intense competition or, or um, you, you hear this from marathon runners. Uh, that they are just going into the so-called zone. Well, I think all of us are capable of going into the zone if you know, if you've kind of mastered something like the piano or flying an air uh, an airplane. Um, anyway, I'm just I'm just adding some commentary to think I I like your answer and I'm just underscoring that I think that's how Toy Sensei looks at it. The idea is, wouldn't it be great if we could be mirror like all the time? Yes. No, technically we can, if we just get out of our own way. But the idea is um, that's how you know how to respond because the environment is informing you. You're not, you're not being led by your ego. Yeah. Sensei, right. um, Brian Kelly asked the question. Um, uh, and it, please step in, Kelly Sensei, if I don't get it right. Um, about the OODA loop. Were you exposed to um, the OODA loop? Um, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act in your military training? Which was a... I'm was sorry, a, I didn't understand the question. Kelly Sensei asked, um, how do you feel the OODA loop fits into this? Um, which was uh, a military strategy taught in the U.S. Air Force observe, orient, decide, act, Uda? Do you? Yeah, you're, you're doing that all the time, really. <laughs> and by the way, when I was in the Pentagon, I was on a debriefing team with the guy that developed that Uda loop. Right. So um, I guess, I guess uh, Kelly Sensei, do you want to clarify your question? How did that play into your understanding of uh, uh, this whole thing. Well, it, it, I, I guess it just sort of all runs together. You're, you're constantly observing what's going on, hopefully, uh, and not only what's on the ground, but what's around you in the air, so somebody doesn't run into you, or you don't run into somebody else. Um, you're, you're observing ground fire uh, and hoping that you can stay away from that as much as possible. Uh, you make decisions based upon these observations, and then you, you're constantly readjusting and adapting to the situation uh, all the way through there. So uh, it's a it's a it's a constant OODA loop. I th I think maybe Brian Kelly and Bolton Marsh uh, were looking for were fishing for a story about Colonel Boyd. About what? <laughs> about about, Boyd. about about John Boyd who. Uh, um, who he, he, they say you know you know you know he he chewed his his fingernails down to a to bone i never saw anything <laughs> but, but anyway he, he, was, he was a brilliant guy and um there there were four of us on this briefing team and and he was the one that covered the uh the uh, uh the flying aspect the operational aspect of it energy maneuverability as he termed it so, you know, I, I was covering the technical intelligence side of it. Anyway, uh, I don't know whether that answers the question, but hopefully it does some, somewhere in there. They can give you a thumbs up. Uh, it wasn't my question. <laughs> else? I, I guess I'm just wondering if that uh, would be third order, I guess. Could you hear me? That was breaking up just, just a little bit, Bob. So uh, Kelly Sensei asked, would you classify that as third order? Uh, 
classify what as third order? The uh, using using that OODA loop cycle. Um, you could, and again, that yeah, I, I guess it would probably fall in the, in the third order category because you're you're constantly moving around the circle here. But yet that whole circle should be centered on one focal point, the mission. Sensei, Sally Mills writes, you trained under sub several sensei. Can you share special qualities you learned from each of them? Uh, I want dirt. <laughs> well, um, that's difficult to do. Uh, they all were excellent instructors and excellent people. Uh, I have to say that Shin Sensei was really, I was very fortunate in, in starting out with him because he really got me on the path and sort of pushed me along the path and helped me along the path and uh, helped me to understand a lot of this stuff that uh, is not often that easy to understand. Um, Maida Sensei uh, is a good instructor also. Uh, and I learned, I'm not sure, I learned different things from him. He was a little bit more physical than, uh, than some. Um, and of course, uh, Simcox Sensei, I think most of you know Simcox Sensei, so he was, he was a jewel also. Uh, and, and, and Shane of Sensei, what can I say? You know, uh, <laughs> uh, outstanding all the way. <laughs> but as far as as far as specific things that I learned from specific ones, uh, I don't know. That's hard to say. They all sort of flow together after all these years. Alexander uh, Kutin uh, writes your Tai Chi practice. What did it give to your Kiaikido, and what did your Kiaikido give to your Tai Chi? Uh, they're both uh, very closely related, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, I, I trade off between my classes. I use uh, uh, Aikido principles in my Tai Chi class. I test key test or Chi test in every one of the postures uh, in, in the forms that I teach. Uh, uh, but I've also uh, Tai Chi postures, the, the, the uh, softness, uh, for example, push hands, the softness in push hands, it's helped me to feel the softness if somebody takes my wrist. I can feel actually the skin movement and tell what, where their mind is just from that pretty much. Uh, it's it, they complement each other very well. Um, from Michael Williams, you gave an example of keeping one point when you were completely tensed in a in a high G maneuver. You uh, tensed your gut so that you couldn't feel one point. Are you saying that's how you located one point and put your mind there? I. <laughs> I've never really thought so much of keeping my mind at one point because my mind needs to be other places as well. Uh, I'm, I think tend, tend to think more of the relaxation aspect than, than many other, many other uh, principles. Uh, but I, the, I do, what I just noted there was that the fact that I learned afterwards that when I did tight, tense up my, my gut, I could feel that tenseness all around that area, except it in one spot, which I later learned was the one point. So um, that's that's about it. <laughs> so, by the way, I might while we're while we're talking about the four points again, there. Um, uh, on, on the, the uh, keeping weight underside and, and settling into the cockpit. Uh, 
when you when you sit naturally, you want good posture. So has anybody heard of Shisei? So you want to you want back straight. You don't want to hunch. If you pull a lot of G's, you're going to ruin your back. Uh, you got to uh, keep your head up, keep your head out of the cockpit, as they used to say, um, and uh, that that sort of uh, sounds something like she sin, doesn't it? Uh, keeping your head up, looking at the horizon, and uh, not peering down at your feet and at the mat and what have you. Uh, so there, there are so many things that uh, relate uh, to to flying and to uh, to Aikido, to the four principles. I just wish I could have started uh, earlier, early, earlier when I was in Japan. But unfortunately, uh, my buddy uh, uh, MacArthur, he, he forebode all martial arts at that time. So we were not allowed to practice any martial arts. So I'm sure it was going on somewhere in the deep, dark caverns of the cities, but who knows? Anything else? Well, uh, Gardner Sensei, Shinner Sensei, we're at time. Shinner okay. Sensei, any closing remarks? Gardner Sensei, any closing remarks? No, I don't think for you're speaking to me. Oh, anyway. I was speaking to both of you. To both of me. Both <laughs> you and Shaner Sensei. So Gardner Sensei, do you have any closing remarks? I, I have a couple, but I'll let you go first. No, uh, other than just as I say, the, the, the coincidence of the four principles with everything that I learned earlier in flying just fits so so neatly together. And so it's just a, an additional proof that in fact, universal universality does exist um, as, as everybody else has proven as well. So uh, that's, that's basically it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gardner Sensei, and thank you for all of your contributions to the Aikido world, uh, not just EKF, but the Aikido world. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I would like to tee up, as I always do at the conclusion, very briefly next week's class. And that means I need to talk about my mailbox for a second. Um, as most of you know, I've spent a short time in law enforcement and a much longer time teaching law enforcement officers arrest control and conflict resolution. And so people have been asking me to share a perspective on how to apply our principles that is key in daily life related to two topics um, that uh, my mail has been coming in over the weeks that I would like to address next week. And so in response to your questions, the first topic is gonna to have to do with excessive use of force, uh, as evidenced most recently by the tragic death of George Floyd, as well as many other, if we really look at it, many other people, like there is such a thing as excessive use of force. And I spent a lot of time trying to counter that in my own way as key in daily life when I was uh, involved in that activity. And the second topic uh, is systemic racism that um, uh, people have asked me to comment on as it reflects the same principle, which is potentially excessive use of force. But uh, that's a broader topic. So <clears throat> in preparation, what I'm going to do is chapter two of Living with the Wind at Your Back is called The Art of Compassion. And while many chapters have all kinds of different stories, this one chapter kind of uh, is uniquely focused on my experience in law enforcement. And the art of compassion is, is, is uh, what I wanna talk about uh, next week. So if you have the book, you might wanna 
reread chapter two. Um, the theme, when I was in the Pitkin County Sheriff's Department, this is going to sound strange, but the theme that I'm going to develop is something that was a mantra. In fact, it was a campaign slogan of our sheriff, Dick Keenest. Uh, and it was the following words, trust is a social good. Uh, this was inspired from Othello, written by Shakespeare, which tackled racial prejudice, jealousy, and lying. And um, Dick Keenis, the sheriff, was uh, a product of, the Not of Notre Dame, uh, great books, classics, and he was a teacher at St. Mary's College in, in uh, the Bay Area. And so he he was an academic and found himself in Aspen, and, and I'll tell the story of who he was. Uh, we created quite a stir, so much so that CBS did a 60 Minutes program on what we were doing in Pitkin County. And it was really uh, to create a complete change of consciousness. The trust uh, that uh, Dick envisioned was right out of Plato's Republic. Uh, Plato's Republic was his favorite book, and Plato's Republic is about how to create a just society. So my experience in law enforcement was part of a grand experiment, really, a social science experiment, um, to try to create trust between uh, the civil servants, which we were as law enforcement officers, and the citizenry. So how do you build trust? Uh, it seems to me what we were doing then is, is completely relevant now. So I, I think I was just fortunate to be involved in this experience, but I would like to share that experience because again, we're talking from our own perspectives, but these topics are on the, you know, the, the tips of everyone's mind, uh, uh, at least here in the United States uh, with Black Lives Matter and um, other movements and, and clearly the whole topic of, you know, defunding police uh, or is there some other way? So uh, I'll be tackling, I guess, a current events topic, but it comes from all your questions uh, and uh, I'll do my best to share what limited experience I have. And uh, I look forward to that call next week. So I hope to see you then. And uh, if you're interested in that topic, uh, tell other people. Uh, we'll do it next Thursday. And um, I'm very grateful, as always, to see your faces um, looking around. Uh, is, I, I just thank you for taking time out of your day and allowing us to be together um, in your home or outside your home. I see Kelly Sensei is sitting in his nice porch. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I really appreciate you and uh, thank you very much, Harold Sensei, for hosting. Uh, Freiling Sensei is on business in California today. Um, and Gardner Sensei, uh, as always, uh, stupendous. So thank you for your time and attention, everyone. I hope you have a great week. Thank you, Shannon Sensei. Thank you very much, Gardner Sensei. Wonderful job. Thank uh, you. Be well, all, and hope to see you all next week.